Okay, we um, have a nice long list of people on Skype. It looks like this in that little camera that the Skype people are looking through. We hope to replace that soon so you might actually be able to read not just, you know, the chalkboard, but maybe. Okay, Jessica? Okay, Julie, Jessica, Julie. I'm looking for all the J's. Jesus. Uh, Joseph. Jerry. No, that's Mary. Steve. Celia. Faf. Amy. Bibi. Grr. The Rose of Sharon, which is not what I called her last time that I read her name off. And Mike Gentry. Hey. By the way, in case most of y'all don't know that, Mike is usually on on Thursday nights. Well, at other times, like like Mondays, he's really off. <clears throat> okay. Oh, speaking of that, um, who was it? Was it Mike? No, it was it was Ben Kashatka said that he re-listens to a certain a certain uh, teaching in the Revelation series. He said he loves it, and he says he listens to it over and over. He said, but when I started that one, I took about five to ten minutes going over the list and talking to everybody. And he says, could you ask Lindsay to please take that off? I don't want to hear that every time. I want, uh-oh, Kelly's going. Okay, thanks, people. <laughs> thanks, people. Who put this duck up here? Oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> All right. Now we can start. We didn't already start, did we? Good for you. <clears throat> right. Okay, let's go to um, Genesis 15, and we're going to look at verses 12 through 21. We're going to move past um, talking about the stars and the offering. We've been there a while. Okay, but now we're going to move into the rest of this that happens to Abraham, <clears throat> or Abram, as he is called at this point. Verse, starting verse 12, we'll go down through 21. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. And they shall afflict them four hundred years, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance. Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. It came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Talking about the, the animals, the sacrifices that he cut open and laid, laid open. Verse 18, in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kizites and the Gadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephiums, which are not ites at all, um, and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about uh, verse 12. Uh, let's talk about all of it if we can get as far as we can. Uh, verse 12 talks about the sun going down and a deep sleep fell on Abram and lo and horror of darkness fell upon him. Okay, so <clears throat> one of the things, uh, the, the main thing that we need to pursue um, is the heart of the Lord. Now you need to know the scriptures for that, you, you know, because the Holy Spirit will breathe Life. Remember, I used an example the other day that 
The scriptures are nothing but an empty vessel that the Holy Spirit fills with the life of Jesus. Okay? And they'll remain just ink on white paper if the Holy Spirit isn't open in our eyes. But it helps to know the scriptures. But we're knowing the scriptures not to be Pharisees. We're knowing the scriptures because Jesus said in John 5, 39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, meaning you search the scriptures, you guys, thinking that it, there's just life in searching the scriptures, or that's where your life is. But they are they which testify of me, and you will not come to me that you might have life. So <clears throat> the, the goal, we can, we can say the goal is to know Jesus. We can say the goal is to have Christ revealed to us by the Spirit of God through the Word, through the Scriptures. But um, we can misread so much if we don't know the heart of the Lord. You know, email does that. You can email somebody and, and they go, well, what do you mean by that? And you're going, you know, Gosh, I wish you knew me a little better because I wasn't saying what you thought I was. Most of us have experienced something like that. Um, so we need to quit being in an email relationship with the Lord. <laughs> you know what I mean? We need an email. <clears throat> Amen. But our desire after becoming Christians and having certain things settled should be to know the heart of the Lord. And if you don't, you'll read scriptures like this. A, a deep sleep fell on Abram and a an horror of great darkness fell upon him. <clears throat> and you will wonder or you will let your mind go to places it shouldn't go because you don't know the heart of the Lord. And when I say knowing the heart of the Lord, I don't just mean knowing that, you know, he's ultimately he'll be kind to you or something like that. I mean knowing the things that move his heart, knowing the things that, were, that are important to him when he created everything, knowing the things that are important to him now, knowing the things that were important to him before the foundation of the world. All right, so we're at a disadvantage then because we are born into this earth and we, we go by our senses, our five senses, more than we go by our heart and our spirit. And we try to perceive everything based on the past knowledge that we've had and the past experiences that we've had, you know, and so all people are basically just mean, you know. I mean, you know, you can... You <laughs> and, uh, and all of that is going to add up to certain conclusions before you even know him as father. I mean, I, you may know the name, but you don't really understand that we've entered into a relationship with the Father and His Son. And, and if we do know those scriptures, and if we do know that as a fact, that's still not, it's not good enough. It is not good enough. I mean, somewhere we have to be, or we don't, I mean, we may not, but somewhere we have to be confronted with, we don't, number one, we don't know everything. Number two, uh, we don't know Him like we should. We're so busy going to him to get answers for our life down here that we're not even pursuing, you know, knowing his heart in relationship to things before the foundation of the world or after it's over with or whatever. Um, we're totally into the, in the dark in those things, and we will be, you know, in eternity past or whatever unless... Um, unless our pursuit becomes something greater than us, greater than us, greater. My God, I know that we're all so great, but good grief, it's got to be greater than us. And he is that, and he is that, and it's worth it. And it will, oh, it will also 
um, open the scriptures to you because the scriptures were written, uh, you know, he's the one, Jesus is the one who said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Well, that's what he did. Out of the abundance of his heart, he spoke. But we just see creation and we don't, we, we just say, well, he's the creator then. We don't see that all things were made for him and by him and to him and through him and by him all things consist. And if we read that scripture, it doesn't make any sense to us. It just says to us, he's, he's pretty big God, you know, he's powerful or something like that. And we don't realize that's the, that's the father giving us those scriptures talking about his son or that's the spirit of God breathing forth the heart of the father in relationship to his son and in relationship to us therefore and I say all of this because everything that I just read everything that we've read up to this point in Genesis pertaining to Abraham everything has had to do with one subject the firstborn son, finding who is the firstborn son. Abraham, you need to find out who is the firstborn son and what that means, okay? So then he goes, okay, well, it's Lot. It's got to be Lot because Sarah's barren. See, already we're knocked out of the ballpark. We don't even understand what it is. We're, uh, because Sarah was the one who ended up bringing forth the seed. But we're going by our senses. We're going by our understanding. We're going by everything. And, and so, and it, it, you know, God gave us a mind. God gave us all of this. I'm not saying don't use that. I'm saying pursue the Lord beyond that. It's fine. Yes. Do me a favor. Think. Do me another favor. Don't be passive. I don't want you passive. I want you alive and moving. Um, but, but the Father wants you in tune with him in relationship to to his son so so we have this um, abraham sleeps he goes into a deep sleep he goes into a death um, we i think we mentioned this maybe slightly that it's the same thing that happened to um what's the guy's name adam thank you <laughs> like I really forget that one <laughs> and uh, and he put him into a deep sleep and we go well you know why is he why is he putting Abraham into a deep sleep and why is there this this horror of darkness that falls upon him and what's going on here and well God puts Adam into a deep sleep and then opens up his side if you're looking at that you're going you know did he choose elective surgery? <laughs> you know, did he know this was going to happen? You know, we're wondering what's going on. And Abram's going through the, a similar thing, and both of them are going through a death to bring forth life for others. That's what it is, which is reminiscent of God's firstborn, his firstborn son. Okay, so... When we see this, then we don't go off onto weird trails or stuff. We, we realize, like I said, from the very beginning with, with Abram all the way through up to this point, everything, everything has been to this end. And so now Abram has, as we remember, he's made statements, you know, well, you know, that's great that you've done all this stuff, but where is the seed that you promised? Well, God's talking to him. He's using God language. He's using crucified language. He's trying to make it real and practical. He's not just showing him something and says, I'll never forget all those stars, or even seeing God's face and going, this is how you feel about your son, and you see him in such magnitude and greatness, and that's a strength to me, but that's still what's in you. 
whereby comes the next word, shall I know? And so he brings forth the sacrifices, and he lays out the sacrifice, and he cuts them all open. He opens them up towards heaven and opens up towards God's heart because God's saying this is, this is whereby shall you know. But then, you know, and then he's, he's chasing off the fowls of the air, which I think we dealt with last time. But now he's dealing with Abraham. Abram. Now he's going to go through it. He needs to experience this death. He needs to experience this reality of what's going to come out of this. And then he needs to see the pattern. And he needs to understand there's a pattern of God's heart. And he needs to understand that if you get that pattern, you, you'll have eyes. You will start to see. And, and, and you will not just understand scriptures. You'll look and you'll go, of course this is, would say this because this is his heart. This is the way he thinks. This is the way he feels about his son. And this is the way he brings it about. So he puts him into a, a deep sleep. And he doesn't explain to him the fullness of that horror of darkness that Jesus went through on the cross. He doesn't explain, my son will go through this. My son will be through, put through death. And like with Adam, his side will be opened. And from my death, the bride will come forth that will become the wife of the lamb. Oneness, just one of many that had become one with the one. And he doesn't explain all that to him. Um, we need to know him well enough to, to understand that these are the things he's going to do. If he's sitting there showing you, I mean, he's, he's smiling and glowing brighter than all the stars over the thought of his son and the magnitude of him. Um, but then he turns to Abram and says, get these animals and cut them open and lay them in order and then this fire falls and the lamp passes through and all of this stuff um, then Abram needs to start perceiving he needs to start perceiving there's a, there's a flow here he's flowing away from all that I thought I thought he would just bring me a son maybe even appear on a mountain and hand me a son and it would all be glorious, and I know the Son, and God revealed his Son, and all this kind of stuff. And he said, but he, or he would think, but he's, when I said, how shall I know? Whereby shall I know? He made an altar. He told me to make an altar. You make an altar. You put sacrifice on there. Now you be the sacrifice. And this is how I'm going to do it. This is how I'm going to do it. And I'll prove it to you in this, because you're wondering about your seed. I've already told you it would be as stars of heaven. I'll talk about them then in this process. I'll talk about them. I'll show you. I'll, I'll literally prophesy to you exactly what's going to happen, which he does. And he does that how? By telling the story of, of the Exodus when they were captives to the Egyptians in the Passover. <clears throat> so he goes, he's, it's like the, this dark death. And he goes into it, Abram goes into it, but maybe he doesn't know that it is a death, but this death is not unto death. This death is not unto death. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's use the example of Lazarus, and Lazarus dies, and the people from the village come and tell Jesus, you know, well, he hadn't died yet. He said he's sick. He's sick. 
and and uh, Jesus doesn't go immediately, and the disciples say, "Hey, what's wrong, man? <laughs> we need to get going." And Jesus says, "This sickness is not unto death." Okay, well, you all do know that he did die, right? <laughs> you know, some of you new guys haven't heard me say this, but. I get nervous if I'm ever sick and somebody prays over me and says, this sickness is not unto death because <laughs> Lazarus died. You know what I mean? It's like, don't pray that. <laughs> but it's not unto death death. You understand? This death was not unto death death. Adam's death was not unto death death. It was a death that was not unto death. It was a death meant to bring forth to bring forth, to bring forth. Okay, so what's, going, what's it going to bring forth out of Abram in this death right here? All the seed, okay? And then what's, what's the death of the seed that he's talking about here that's in bondage for 400 years? What's, what's it going to bring forth? The very thing that God said to Moses on the way to go get him out. Tell Pharaoh, let my Son, go, my firstborn son. I'm telling you, everything here is talking about that theme. Let him go. Let him go out of you. Let him go. But there has to be a death. You can't just go, okay, let go away, little butterfly, firstborn unto the father. <laughs> some, some gloriously cute or ridiculous way, you know. Um, no, no, they're gonna they're going down into a death too, into Egypt. Okay, so um, a dreadful darkness falls on him, and it's funny because it's it's like the wording is there is really good. Um, let's see, and when the sun was going down, a horror of darkness fell upon him. When this okay, so we got two things happening. We got the sun up and no horror of darkness. Then when the sun starts going down, there's a horror of darkness. All right. What does that relate to? Well, I will tell you that for Jesus, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He had to be treated like he was one with us. Like he was us. The father knows what he's going to do. But he needed to go through the horror of darkness. And it's a time where you wonder if God's with you or not. And he's so, he's so much more with you at the cross in truth than he is at any other time. Because that's his purpose. Jesus even beforehand prayed that. You know, father, what shall I say then? Save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Okay? So Jesus knows, but you still have to go through the horror of the darkness where you're, you're just not sure on certain things. But God will bring you through, just like he did Jesus, just like he did Adam, just like he did Abram, just like he did Israel in, in Egypt. But it's necessary. All of it's necessary. You, everything that can be shook will be shook. Amen? That's just a fact. So we need to know what can be shook. Because we think there's a lot of stuff in us that is over in the category of it can't be shook. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And when he starts showing you how shaky and flaky and bakey you are, <laughs> you will begin to cleave that's all you got that's all I got I'm just cleaving to what little I have of you but I'm holding on with dear life and that's okay because it strengthens you your roots go down deep you know when when a when a tree or your plants or whatever when they when it hadn't rained or they haven't got water for a while the roots start going down deeper to find water deeper 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 water to draw from that's what we need. He needs to dry us up at times so that our roots will start going down deeper to find deeper waters than what we're used to. 
All that surface water is fine, but it'll never really become strong until it's gone deeper. All right, so I put darkness as, as came at the same time as the sun sets. Okay? When the sun goes down, the darkness comes. But again, while, it, while um, you know, while it is a death, it is not a death unto death. The sun will come up tomorrow. Anyway, so um, so I wrote in the midst of all of this, Abram has a revelation of the cross. <laughs> in the midst of it, he's finding out what will happen to the firstborn of the father, the beloved of the father, the one whom thou lovest of the father. He's finding out what? Information. No, he's finding the heart of God. He's finding the, what is in the heart of God, and he's finding it more in this darkness than he did looking at all the stars and, and trying to count them and finding how futile that was. More. He's finding his heart more because the stars just showed on, on the Father's face that his glorious love um, uh, for the vastness of his son, how vast he is in the father's heart. But this is showing the nature. Remember we talked about that with the sacrifices. The stars showed one thing, but the sacrifices were pointing to his nature. But folks, if, he, if Abram had walked off after offering up those three animals, or four, whatever it was, uh, and offered them, and said, I know the cross now, he would have been wrong. Wrong, you've got to go through that. Because there's stuff in you, you'll never get rid of until you've gone through some of this stuff. You, you just won't, you can't, I, I couldn't, you know. It took, it took the cross and the reality of it and as it were understanding and going through it like Romans 7, oh, wretched man that I am. You know, we always think, God, help me. God, show me. God, bless me. God, strengthen me. God, do this. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall save me from this body of sin? He's finally turning to a who instead of a him to do it. He knows I'm wretched. I need a who. So, in the midst, he has a revelation of the cross, and the Lord speaks to him. See, God knows what's going on on the inside of him. Even though it's not written here, it says, God says, this is God's response. Know for certain what will happen to thy seed. Okay? Know for certain. You know? How shall I know? Wherewith shall I know about the seed coming forth? No, for certain. What's happening to Abram? Because he's the father of them all. Amen? He's the father of them all. If he goes into death, seed's going to come forth. Okay? There's more explanation of that in chapter 22, but it's, we'll, we'll, we'll be there shortly, within the next seven years. or as the scripture says, in the next 400 years. So he's, he's talking about the seed now in this darkness. In Abram's death, he's talking to him about knowing for certain that the seed's going to come forth. I didn't get one amen for that. <laughs> I mean, that's where he's going to, you know, he's the, he saw the father's glorying in the sun and still ask whereby shall I know and he told him build an altar but then he's saying basically now you're going to be the sacrifice you're going to be the one that's going to go into death and they're going to come out of you okay you 
how to do that if life okay so Jesus said that in John 12 24 we know the scriptures Jesus said except the corn of wheat except the seed fall into the ground and die it abides alone okay Abram do you want to be alone do you want to stay alone you want to stay wishing that you had you know a seed do you want me to change your name now to father of a multitude? Right now, you're exalted father, and you don't even have any kids. Abram means exalted father. Abraham means father of a multitude. So God would say, right, you know, right now, your name is exalted father, and you don't even have any seed. Do you want to remain alone? Is that what you want? No, no. I don't. Then you're going to have to fall into the ground and die. And if it die, it'll bring forth a multitude, much fruit. The seed will come forth. The promise will be fulfilled, but it's not just fulfilled by me one day showing up and blessing you. Now, jumping ahead, only slightly. In chapter 22, when God says to Abraham, offer up your son, your, your, the son whom you love, your firstborn son, the son whom thou lovest, thy, your, you know, your beloved son. He understands. He, just read it. He doesn't go through anything. He prepares. And the next morning, he's off. His hands over there with a knife ready to plunge because he understands what it'll take. But he's already, Abraham at that time, has already settled it in his heart, already settled it in his heart of what it'll take and is committed to it. It's called the faith of Abraham. That's the faith of Abraham. That's the reality of his faith. If you are Christ, you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And, and, and that's what's supposed to be working in all the seed. What? The, the heart of the father, the heart of being a firstborn, unlike, unlike in, in Exodus 12 where God says, you know, kill a lamb and eat it, and this will save all of the firstborn, but not all of Israel. You'll be delivered. The rest of you will be delivered, but the firstborn will be redeemed with the purpose of being mine. The firstborn of all is mine, God said. He said it so many times. It's mine. I bought it, and they need to be mine in spirit. So Abraham, Abram is, is, he's finding all this out. He's getting it worked in him. He's starting to understand now. But just vaguely, he's still got a long way to go. There's still a lot of bumps on this road. But you don't, you don't understand this faith of Abraham you will not understand it just by hearing it, just by sitting in a class and having even the Spirit of God fall on you and really hit you with it once. It really is a faith walk. And that faith has to build till it's in you. It's how you see. You can spot it in the scriptures. You can, you can spot it in circumstances where you need, you know, you need to flow with that and it's it's you that's the deal and that's what Abraham represents he represents yes he's the father of faith but he's also the one who had to go through so much stuff to finally get to the point where it was second nature to him as I usually say first nature but <clears throat> okay so um, 
So he says that the, your seed will be strangers in a country not their own. Okay. So Abraham is, you know, probably two views of that. One is he's going, oh, you mean like me? <laughs> he's in the land, but he's a stranger in that land. He doesn't own it yet. God said it's yours, but he hadn't walked it out. Walk. There's a lot to this walk stuff. See, you know, it'd be it'd be great if we could just have a conference, and then like Jim could just stand up there and go, Phew, and everybody gets it, and we walk out and go, wow, yeah. But it takes it's a walk. It takes time. It takes soaking. It takes seeking. It takes it takes being confronted with your Ishmaels. It does. And you say, well, you know, that's terrible. Abraham really failed God. <laughs> well, then, you know, but God's going, you're just full of Ishmael's, you know. But we don't know it. We, we are sincere. And when we're sincere about all of our little Ishmael's. Oh, no, this is because Abraham, Abraham did that with Ishmael. You remember that? He's, going, he's petting him and going, no, oh, that Ishmael would live before you. We'll get to that. But, it's, uh, but I'm jumping ahead just to show you that this thing really is a process, and it has to do with certain levels of stuff. And if you're not, you know, if you're not moving from level to level, if you're not moving along with it, it's just this teaching, and okay, that was, that was really good, and this one, okay. That, but none of it, it's, it's not like a a big puzzle that's being put together. Um, I think I was talking to Chris about that, you know, 5,000 piece puzzle, you know, and you start and you put something together, you know, it's kind of cool, but you know, it's like the corners are easy, you know, <laughs> or the sides of all that or whatever. But it's when all of a sudden you find a piece and you know exactly where it goes. That's, that's fun. That's like, that, this goes right here. Yes, it fits, you know? It fits. Well, you know, try walking in with a 5,000-piece puzzle dumped upside down, and all you see is shapes, and they're all laying individual pieces. Try putting it together then. You don't see anything. You know, at least before you have kind of an idea, you could look on the box and go, well, it's got trees, it's green, so let's put the green stuff together. You know, something like that. But when it's upside down and all you see is cardboard and a bunch of pieces, you're going, well, okay. I don't, you know? Well, that's kind of what we do sometimes. We don't, we don't stay with it. We don't keep digging in. We don't keep going after saying, Lord, show me, bring me, um, <laughs> carry me, drag me, <laughs> whatever <laughs> it takes. But I need to go from glory to glory, as it were. I need to go from, what does it say in Isaiah? Um, I forget. It says a lot in Isaiah. Y'all don't know what it says there? <laughs> line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Well, Imagine, imagine just sitting in a class and you get a piece and then you go, that was really good. And then you go home and you put it in a little notebook. And then next week you go in and get another piece. And go, oh, that was really good. That's good. You know, I'm going to save this one. I'm going to try to remember this one. You put it in your pocket. You got pieces all over the place. You're not fitting any of it together. You're just going through the motion. All right, so, it, so Abram and God's dealing with him is trying to make a faith walk out of this, and it's trying to make it where we see when the puzzle's put together, we see the face of Jesus and we're changed into that same image from glory to glory, okay? <clears throat> All right, so, so know this. Your seed 
is going to be a stranger in a, in a foreign land. And Abram's going, I think I get that one because he said, leave your unforeign land, your familiar land, and all of that, and come to a place that I will show you. Okay. So he's going, yeah, I guess that would be, that would be right. That would, that would make sense. And then um, the scriptures call us strangers and sojourners. Did you know that? Some of you are sojourners or some of you are strange. <laughs> and I won't tell you which one, but one of you is the one who put this little duck on the microphone. <clears throat> I think it was, who was that? All right. <clears throat> but this isn't foreign to us. It happened to Abraham. He says it's going to happen to his seed. We are strangers in a foreign land unless we've made it so comfortable down here that this is, we're not strangers down here. That we're not going through, we're not here for death. That's why, that's why Abraham was there. He was there for death. And, he, and that's why Israel, your seed, is going to go down into there, and they're going to go through all kind of stuff, but I will bring them out. That's called death, burial, and resurrection. We're here for death so that his life can come forth, and that's called resurrection, his life coming forth. We're here for that. That's why we're here on this planet. No of a surety. <laughs> no, I'm telling you that. No of a surety. That's why you're here. This is it, that Christ may rise out of this darkness, that Christ may rise out of that darkness that Abraham went through, that Christ may rise out of the, the um, darkness of the Egyptian captivity, if you will, that the firstborn may come out of it unto the Father, in sacrifice. Amen? amen? We're not done yet. That's not a, we're done, amen, okay. <laughs> All right. So I wrote, uh, based on verses 13 and 14, the cross will come enslaved and maltreated for 400 years. Well, you're not going to live to be 400 years, so you don't have to worry about that. <clears throat> But the point is, is um, let's jump way ahead. Let's talk about Joseph for a second. Uh, Joseph receives all of these visions from God, and he comes and he's excited, and he tells his brothers, you know, what the vision was that I'm going to be exalted, and all of y'all, including all my all my brothers and even my father, you're all going to bow down to me. And I'm so excited because I know this is from the Lord. And it was from the Lord. Right? It just didn't go the way he thought. I'm so excited. And, and I know y'all are going to get the spirit of it too because you can tell that I got this from the Lord. And they're going, we're going to kill you, buddy. <laughs> you know? And so he's beaten up by his brothers. He's thrown in a pit. Then he's sold to who? Ishmael. Ishmael. And taken where? Egypt. That's Hagar and her son. Oh, yeah, we still got a lot to deal with that. We haven't even touched that yet. Yeah, it's good. So he gets down there. What happens? He gets enslaved and, and maltreated. He's the first one. He is the first one. He's the father's choice. He's the father's beloved son. You know. So all we're talking about here is a pattern over and over and over. It happens to Joseph, and then they come down, the, the brothers and the family, and then they stay down, then, then they grow, and then this happens, and then they're enslaved, and then they're maltreated, just like they did to Joseph. <laughs> I 
We go, gosh, this is a confusing book. I can't follow it. It's like, no, it's pretty much just telling the same story with different characters. <clears throat> um, so I wrote it. First, Abram had power to drive off the, the fowls of the air, the buzzards, the whatever. But now, asleep, he has no power to save his seed from the cross. We could miss it and say he has no power to save his seed from the devil. Or he has no power to save his seed from the horrible Egyptians. Uh, I, he's rendered inoperative. He's put in a position where he has no strength and he's weak and now he's you know he's not the father of a multitude and now he's not the you know the 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 friend of god he is totally weak because god has to do that sometimes to us to let others go through the cross can i get amen but we don't, we're like, oh, no, i got to save you from the cross. Well, if you saw that was the cross, would you really do that? You know what I'm saying? If you really saw that they're, what they're going through is the Lord's hand, which, I mean, is the devil really as powerful as we make him? I mean, is he really in that big a control with everybody's life when we have to just continually pray the fouls away? See, he didn't pray the fouls away from um, himself, Abraham didn't say, don't let any fowls come down and, you know, try to take this out of me. He just went into death. Jesus, you know, Jesus didn't hang up there and say, I'm with you, Father, but let me do this first. Satan, I rebuke you! And you hear it all the way around the world. Rebuke, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? The hands of, of the Pharisees and the, and the chief priests and the, and the high priest could have been moved by the enemy. We know that, that Judas was. Didn't it say Satan himself went into him? Does it say that? Jesus didn't go, well, that's it. I ain't going through this death if the devil's going to try to kill me. Right? Think about it. Come on. Let's get real. He didn't do that. He said, Father, forgive them. And, and on what basis? They clearly don't know what's going on here. They clearly have no clue. This is just another incident in Jerusalem with many others going on with other people and other players. And so let's just flow and let's read the newspaper and see how many there are. All the different stories, you know. He's, he's not a story. He's the son of God. He's the firstborn dying for the whole world, and not just the world at that time, but everyone who would come afterwards, whosoever will. And they're going, well, you know. Or somebody, somebody you know, John or Mary could have said, the devil did this to, you know. Well, if we don't know the heart of God and we can't, we can't put these pieces together and then see Christ, we're just going to go, we're going to say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at everything here and we're going to say, okay, we're in a world where there's two forces, you know, two kinds of people. Um, those who are of God and those who are not. Good and evil. It's all about good and evil. There's good and there's evil. Well, that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, don't eat of it. Okay. We go to a movie. What's it about? Good and evil. <laughs> and we go, oh, I'm rooting for the good. I like this tree. It's the same as the evil part. You need to realize that. You need the tree of life, which is going to bring about a death to bring forth life, except the seed fall into the ground and die to bite alone. But if it died, it brings forth much fruit. So, so I wrote, talking about Abram had no power to drive off, but now asleep, no power to save his seed from the cross. All this will end 
in the enslavers being judged, that's what he says in verse 14, Egypt will be judged because God will, you know, God will take care of it. Afterwards, they'll come out and return and they'll be blessed. Now, there's a whole bunch to that. We haven't even got to that, but we will get more to that as we go. And then Abram's fate will eventually, will, because he's gone through the death, he will die at a good old age. I like the way that it says that. It sounds a little Texan to me. <laughs> he died in a good old age. I tell people I, I want to die the way my grandfather died, just fell asleep in the arms of the Lord, and not like the other people in the car he was driving who were screaming and yelling. <laughs> All right, I need to. That's a good note to end on. Okay, could we please move on here? Thank you. So let me ask you this. Is there a lot in here that pertains to the Lord? Is there a lot that God wants to say, and yet it's all broken down into a very simple thing? The heart of the Father is the heart of a Father. Now that's, that's a revelation to some, because they are just, oh, God, it's just God, it's God. There's a God, there's a supreme being, and, you know, the heart of the Father is the heart of a Father. And that father loves his son. And he chose to put that son in us, which there is no, I mean, that, you know, if for no other reason, we should say that's a treasure in an earthen vessel. You know, he chose to put that son in us. But he wants that son in his spirit, not in our spirit. He wants him to, to, to bear, as it were, the death in a certain spirit so that life can come forth. And it's not all about, you know, I mean, it's not, every moment is not death in the sense of going through certain things and going into death. It's not. But the only ones that count are the ones that you understand and you have that spirit. You let his spirit, his nature, you let him deal with, you know, the people who did this to you and say, Father, forgive them, you know, and bless those who curse me and do good to those who hate you. And yes, Lord, yes, yes. But we, you know, we take vengeance up and we say, well, I'll get back at them, you know, and the Lord said, vengeance is mine. You know, I want you to mull over this, but I do not want you putting forth your hand to deal with anybody. You need to mull over it so you can see what's really stewing inside of you, boiling in your little boiling pot. But if you put your hand forth in that stew, I'm going to be upset with you then. Now it's no longer going to be about my son in you and them. I'm going to have to deal with you. Well, that's a better note to end on. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you that you are the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus told us when we pray to pray our Father. <clears throat> but we need to understand that it's not just you're the Father of, of uh, just everyone in the sense that, that we understand fatherhood, but you have placed the Son inside of us. You've placed the sun inside of us. And you, you desire us to be good ground for the seed, for the sun, to be able to bring forth his kind of fruit instead of our dirt fruit, rocks and thorns and thistles and weeds. You desire his fruit out of us. And Father, we should count that the highest blessing we could have to have him inside of us to be able to come forth to you. 
to not have to be the center of everything, to not have to be important, to say he's, he's important. And I'm an earthen vessel. I'm not even just a vessel. I'm an earthen vessel. But you put him in me, and I trust you to bring him forth because I want that spirit. I want the spirit of the lamb in me. I want the spirit of your son. I want the spirit of the family to flow out of me. I want to fit in with your family by one nature, one life. All those stars having one life, the life of the firstborn. So, Father, move, move, keep us stirred, keep us hungry, keep us seeking. Break us out of our slow ways and our distractions and our the things that so seem so important to us that we would we would give up on you or that would we would put them before you as if that's more important than your son we want to be with you and we know that you can manifest and bring forth your heart that you said that new covenant would be based on a new heart, new spirit, your heart, your spirit. So we thank you. We're going to trust in that and not trust in ourselves. But we're going to cry out. We're going to seek. Because you said if we seek, we will find. And, Father, we're going to knock because you said you would open to us. So we ask it. We believe it. We stand with you in it in Jesus' name and by his spirit and by the promise of the life that you put within us. All of the promise of what will bring forth by his seed within us. Thank you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.